said, partner, how is about I just mosey on in there and you can take me on a little horsey ride? Quarantine. Now here's a fucking game. Okay, before I say anything, let's take a look at this company logo. You know that saying, it takes one to know one? Well, I recognize this look. I know exactly what he's thinking. This is the look of a man whose progress has halted because he needs more test subjects for his experiment. So let's not disappoint him and get started. Quarantine is a first-person, open-world, driving shooter. You play as Drake Edgewater, this guy right here. It's 2048 and you're living as a cab driver inside Chemo City. Which strikes me as if you took Detroit and just moved it out west. The big industry here used to be hover cars, except it got overrun by crime. So overrun that it reached crisis levels, so the company Omnicore stepped in to just build a giant wall around the city and trap everyone in like an escape from New York. But let's back up a second. Omnicore. I knew that name sounded familiar to me. Wasn't that the name of the company from Robocop? Oh, close. Omni Consumer Products. So this game clearly took some inspiration from Robocop. It definitely has some of that atmosphere, as you'll find out. But wait a minute. There was a Robocop remake in 2014. I actually haven't seen that since I cannot imagine it being better than the original, despite having Michael Keaton in it. But I did some research, and in the remake, the company is named Omnicore. What's more is the remake takes place in 2028, and the manual to quarantine first refers to Omnicore in 2029. So we've come full circle. Uh, anyway, after sealing everybody inside the city, Omnicore decides to release a drug into the water supply to calm everyone down and suppress criminal thoughts. Well, that backfires, and instead of calming people, it turns everyone psycho causing half the population to, and I quote the manual, become crazed, violent, killer lunatics intent on killing anyone who is not a crazed, violent, killer lunatic. So the goal of this game is to survive and get the hell out of there. Sounds good to me. Oh, and before we get started, this game is about as violent as Robocop also. So if you're squeamish, you better get out of the cab now. I'll have something tamer for you next time. And here is the game. They just toss you right in and you'll likely be rear-ended within seconds. Just about every driver you see at worst wants to kill you and at best just wants you off the road. They'll sometimes open fire on you, they're constantly dropping mines, and they're not shy about ramming you. Now, you're not a defenseless lamb lost in the woods. You start off with some hood-mounted guns yourself and can blow away most drivers if they piss you off too much. Ah! My paint job! Now while that's pretty awesome, you have limited ammo, which you have to pay for at vendors around the city. So you usually want to save it for when you really need it. Like in real life, there are just too many people on the road. You can't kill them all. Now besides the drivers, you also have to contend with pedestrians. They come in three flavors. You have people actually trying to hail your cab so they can get a lift. People who just stand out in the middle of the road for no reason with their trench coats. Or try to cross casually when they really shouldn't. If you've ever driven near a college campus, this sort of thing should look familiar to you. And finally, you have psycho motherfuckers who are giddy to take pot shots at your car or lob Molotov cocktails at you. It's not even like you're in their territory. The whole city is their territory. Now, thankfully, the game lets you play man versus car with a reasonable degree of accuracy. Not that that discourages them any. They may not look like much under my bumper, but just driving through the wrong street can really eat away at your car's armor. These guys really can be a problem the more you drive. Also, it doesn't make any sense, but I love how you'll sometimes see people jump off buildings then start moseying over to come kill you. Apparently, broken legs only slow them down. Now, this is an open world game, so you can just drive around and go wherever you want. It is huge, too. 
Take a look at the map for this level. And since I'm a map freak, I had to map out the whole thing. Here, this is the entire area that you get to drive in in this game. Wow. Again, this came out in 1994, a year after Doom and three years before Grand Theft Auto. I know this won't impress a lot of people, but I'm honestly kind of astounded by the sheer size of it. Now, you might think they just copied and pasted the same thing over and over again, and while there is some of that, the designers really tried to give the city unique feels. We have a highway, trash in the street, shops, corporate buildings, vacant lots, a drive-in theater, a drive-in mall, surveillance blimps. And this is just the first level. I'll show you the rest later on. For a 20-year-old game, the detail on this is outstanding. I especially love the advertisements you see. Lumpy, some guy with glowing eyes, why not? Play nice, scrape the meat off the street. Yeah, there's a public service announcement for you. Stay inside. Yeah, that's actually really good advice in this town. I mean, you've seen what it's like out here. Now, after a while, you may wonder if there's an actual purpose to this game or if it's just someone's vision of the future and all that awaits us is being run over by hover cars. Well, yes, there is. As you drive around the city, if you stop to pick up the people hailing you, you'll get jobs to carry them around the city and get paid. After all, you do run a taxi service. What do you think? Will taking a taxi several blocks cost you $557 in 2048? I think yes, assuming we're still using dollars by then. Your passengers can be one of the more interesting parts of the game. They have personality. I just ate an entire vat of baked beans and some uncooked pork. Can I ride with you? Fantastic. Here are some Earth dollars. Hello, I'm a doctor and I need to treat a patient. Can you get me there on time? A life depends on it. Of course, because human life is highly valued in this society. Many of the dialogue sequences are fantastic, and while I think they randomly generate the look of the characters, I have no complaints. Look at this guy. Now here is a man from the future. If people aren't dressing like this in 2048, I'm going to be very disappointed. I'm gonna throw this out there. If you haven't figured it out by now, I love the atmosphere to this game. So let's try to add to it. If anyone wants to send me some fan art of either billboards or passengers you think would fit right in this world, go ahead and I'll post my favorites in a follow-up episode later on. This is a long ways off though, so take your time. Anyway, most of your taxi missions are like this. You pick up some freak on the street and take them where they want to go. Occasionally though, you get story missions where they'll have various jobs for you. This can be anything. Delivering shady packages, taking out gang members, to outright bombings. Hey, I promised explosions in this episode. How's this one for you? Yeah, just in case you thought this game wasn't kicking enough ass already, you get to level buildings. How many taxi games let you do that? After a while, the story starts to emerge through these missions, and you find out there's an underground movement rebelling against Omnicore. The more you help them, the closer they get you to escaping Chemo City, and you get to progress to new zones. Along the way, you get to buy upgrades for your cab. You can drop by vendors for weapons or repairs. The weapons are all pretty good. You can get mines, bigger guns, missiles, flamethrowers, miniguns, industrial saw blades to cut through the armor of other cars. You can also get an Uzi as a preferred customer bonus and use it for drive-bys. But honestly, this felt like a gimmick to me more than anything. It looks cool, but it's impractical and really clunky to use. I'm sure it was something they threw in to try and sell the game and make it look cool, but I think they knew full well they were misrepresenting the experience. I'll just park my sweet butt down on this crummy seat. Don't try anything cute, I've got a gun. Anyway, my biggest complaint is that the more weapons you get, the more it clutters up the viewport, which is small enough already. Although the game is happy to remind me I should be thankful for what I have, as it includes a low resolution mode also. Damn. Now on the flip side, you can also visit repair stations. In fact, you will be visiting repair stations. 
a lot. Your car is always getting shot up and you have to keep maintaining it. More on that later. Besides repairs, you can buy nitro to go faster. Also, because these are hover cars, you can upgrade the battery so you can drive longer when you go off the energy grid. That's right, the hover cars work on an electric grid, like trams. This limits where you can drive. It's like DRM for your car. I can't wait for the future. Now, you could also buy steel plating for your car, but I secretly suspect it's just cardboard wrapped in aluminum foil. It practically evaporates after you get it. I can't prove it without spending way more time on it than it's worth, but I have a conspiracy theory that the AI will actually throw more crap your way while you're wearing armor. Lots of attacks seem to come out of nowhere every time I leave the shop after buying this. Also, listen to the shop vendor whenever you buy something. Yeah, that's exactly what you want to hear from a store owner after you've bought something, isn't it? Let's talk about the music. This game came on floppy disk and CD, but the CD version had a soundtrack to go with it. The soundtrack is a mix of punk rock and alternative music. I approve. I mean, let's be honest, this is a punk game. Apparently the bands are all Australian, which is interesting since this is a Canadian game. Maybe they thought it would make sense to use Australian music for a game about a colony full of criminals trapped in an isolated area that they can't escape from. I'm sure Australians have never heard that joke before. Most of the tracks are just kind of okay, but there are a few I like a lot. I don't normally pay attention to lyrics that much, but I thought these were hilarious. This one is a song about someone goading his friend into confessing to a hit and run. You're my friend, guilty but you can tell me anything, let me hear all your sorry fears, let the stars shine on your tears, there's nobody else here, you don't really expect me to believe, he just stepped from me. Yeah, actually, I do expect you to believe he just stepped out in front of my headlights. This motherfucker popped out of a manhole to get run over by me. Why don't you go for a drive around the city before casting judgment on who I run over, huh? I like the vocals from the singer in this song. I mean, try and tell me this girl is not straight up punk. This band is called Scream Feeder. I think they picked an appropriate name. Finally, I like how at one point this song just starts saying glorify the weak over and over again. Like this is some hypnosis exercise. So uh, I guess this episode is dedicated to the weak. My only complaint about the music is for a game as big as this is, it could have used more. However, this was 1994, they couldn't have really had much more due to space on the disc. MP3s didn't exist yet. In fact, the installer even encourages you to listen to your own CDs when playing. So they knew it needed more, but they did all they could. Can't complain about that. So back to the game, you eventually get to leave downtown and make it to the park. Nice change of scenery, I guess. Don't pick the flowers, $50 fine. Keep off the grass. Well, shouldn't be a problem since I'm in a hover car. I am on my way to my true love. Please take me. I like how in the future people still have jacked up pickups. Some things don't change much. Chemo Park, relax. Maybe they should have had someone pick up the severed human head lying in front of the sign if they were serious about that message. You have some fun missions in this level, like having to run over zombies rising from their graves, or Portageon assassinations. Also, you get a mission to take out 30 software pirates distributing copies of Quarantine. I think software pirates of the future are likely much more hardcore than the ones of today. I mean, you don't hear about shootouts with the police every time they try and shut down some torrent site. 
Now the irony here is pretty thick since this game does have copy protection. You have to enter in a number code out of a table included with the game. Back in the day, if you lost this, you couldn't play your game anymore. Also, this sheet was exactly as difficult to read as you see it here. The reason for this is it made it difficult to photocopy it on a black and white copy machine. It's copy protected in more ways than one. It's also an early form of copy protection causing a pain in the ass for people who actually own the game, or rather a pain in your eyes. Nowadays, this game is abandonware and you can find copies that already have the protection cracked. So pirates were causing them enough problems that they wanted to hunt them down and kill them in the game, but they're also the reason people can still play this game now. Go figure. Although I'm not being completely fair. At the time of this video, you can still buy this game new on eBay for $324. Free shipping! <laughs> now I've been saying a lot of positive things about this game, and they're well deserved. But I actually never beat this game before, despite dumping a lot of hours into it, and I couldn't remember why. I played this a few years ago, and this park level is as far as I got. But now I'm covering this for the game dungeon, so I decided to go as far as I could this time and really complete the experience. Well, let me tell you, if you just pick up this game and start playing it, it's pretty fun. But if you're actually trying to get through the main missions and beat the game, you're going to have a different experience. Now, I'm not a game designer, but the more I played Quarantine, the more aspects of the gameplay started to scream out at me. First is the driving itself. In addition to being a little clunky, these are hover cars, so you drift like crazy if you need to brake or change direction. This means stopping to pick people up or drop them off isn't always a smooth experience. Slow down! Slow down! Fuck! Worse, if you're in a rush to go somewhere and some idiot pulls in front of you, you'll hit them and ricochet backwards like you're a pinball. No, excuse me, not like a pinball. Like an air hockey puck. This does not help you get to your destination any faster. I have got to get to an important core meeting, Cabby. I will make it worth your while. Sure thing, Mr. Hogan. Now, I've never driven a hovercraft to know how accurate these controls are, but if they're this awkward, that means cars we have right now are the better technology. But really, that's a minor complaint. Let's talk about the damage. Remember how I said almost everybody wants to kill you? Well, they certainly try. Everywhere, at all times. You cannot go for 10 seconds in this game without running into mines all over the road, somebody shooting at you, airships dropping crap on you. It never ends. Now you might see this as a positive thing, like, oh, you're in the thick of the action, but it's relentless. This doesn't increase the tension. It's just a never ending nuisance since you have to keep stopping by repair bays every couple minutes. Now you can buy titanium armor later, but that's only a little better than none at all. Going anywhere in this game is like walking barefoot through a swamp full of leeches then stopping every couple minutes to get a blood transfusion so you don't pass out. Your car's integrity is always being drained and it's just annoying. Aw, oh, please, 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 pretty please, 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 please. But even that is nothing compared to the timer. You have a timer counting down for every job you take. For normal fares, you start losing money every second you go over. I think that's fair, but for the story missions, this becomes a big problem. One of the boss missions for the first level, I had to redo half a dozen times because I had a little over a minute to hunt him down halfway across town, try to find him on my radar, then blow his ass up while he's running away from me at top speed. And if you kill him after the timer runs out, it doesn't count. You have to do it over again. Don't you love games where if you kill the boss, but you're too slow, you lose anyway? Oh, and hey, let's talk about this radar. This radar lies. Yes, it will tell you the general area you need to go to, but it will point to a specific spot. And half the time that is wrong. Oh no, you shouldn't go to this street. You really need to go to this street on the other side of this large ass building, which is going to take another 20 to 30 seconds to get to, depending on traffic. Sure would have been nice to know that ahead of time. 
I'm so riled up about this because this game rides your ass about the clock for every single mission. Doesn't matter what it is. And one of these, you just have to deliver a pizza. Oh, I'm sorry, was your pizza a little cold? How about I deliver your pizza when I feel like it? And in exchange, you don't have to step outside in this hellhole and risk getting shot in the head by some red-eyed psychopath. Oh, this is wonderful. I'm trying to slow down so I can drop off my passenger, but some crackhead behind me is rear-ending me non-stop. I can't see what's happening. I don't even have a rear-view mirror. This game drives me insane. Hi, cab guy. Do you think I could get inside? We can exchange knowledge and money. Do you want to see some pictures of my friends? Do you have any donuts? Have you ever been running late to work and if you hurry up, you might be all right, but instead you keep running into all these slow ass drivers going under the speed limit or consecutive small traffic jams caused because someone's looking at their cell phone instead of the lights? It's this simultaneous feeling of rage and helplessness and quarantine reproduces those feelings exactly. Maybe this hits me a little harder than most, since for a year or two of school, I was commuting about 20 minutes away, and it was a longer road where 90% of it was one lane only, with no passing allowed. One slow driver could and would hold the fate of me getting to class on time or not. However, there was one point where I could get ahead of them, by cutting through a corner gas station while they would be sitting at a light. I'm lucky I never got into an accident because I would fly through here being so desperate to pass them. Especially if there were four or five other cars being held up besides me. Now the payoff to this is sometimes I would get to see these jams coming from the other side, coming back. For fun, I would usually count how many cars one slow driver would be holding up. The most I ever counted was 31. Hey mister, can you possibly take me? I've got to get to work. I'm lonely too. Anyway, this crap happens all the time in this game. It's a road rage simulator, but you don't even get the satisfaction of blowing people up because you're still late. And there are consequences for being late. Oh, that's the best part. I'll come back to that. I know now why I never beat this game. I must have gotten up to the park level boss. First off, you don't know the boss is coming. You just suddenly get the mission and have to hope you're suited up in time. And remember, you can never really be prepared, because the more you drive, the more people are going to be shooting away at your armor. So you start driving towards the boss, but it is vitally important you do not look at the map again. If you look at the map, you've already lost. I didn't realize this right away, but for some reason when you look at the map on this boss fight, it suddenly makes his health become so high it goes off the meter and reports him as not being here, but rather 35 kilometers away, outside the bounds of the map. Once I figured that out, I tried to take this guy out and God is he a bastard. Not only is he an order of magnitude tougher than any other enemy in the game so far, but he hops around everywhere and likes to get behind you. You have to sit and wait for him to land to get a chance to shoot. Assuming you can line up your shots. I mean, he's a worthy boss fight, but considering how much time it takes to even get to this point, it gets old. Anyway, Hoverboy kicks my ass. I die, and I die, and I die. Ah! 3%! I had him at 3%! Die again! Die some more! I just dropped some tabs, and I feel really weird. Out of time! Out of time! Die again! Ah! I finally get lucky and kill him! Jesus Christ! Yeah, I did not make it this far before. So I get a passcode and head to the next level. This one is the Chemo City Old Town. It looks a little more upscale than downtown, though that doesn't mean much in this city. Pig Gulp! What's that, Chinese? Anyone want to try and translate that? Generic games. Yeah, look at that guy. This is what Quarantine thinks of other games on the market. Strontium Grill. Old Sock. Hey! Yeah, if it wasn't for the gunfire and constant vehicular homicide, this wouldn't be too bad a place to live. I'd like to talk to you about the Lord. Will you sing a hymn with me? Mister? So aside from more city variety, you mostly have the same rehash of the missions. You do random transports, 
Some more gang jobs? Another bombing? Hell yeah! And oh my god, another mission where you have to track down some guy across town who's running away from you and kill him all in the span of a little over a minute. This time, it took me seven tries. But after that, you get another mission like this. Though this guy at least can't run away as fast. So after all that, I get my code and head to the next zone, the projects. Yeah! Chew on a pig, I'll be dagnab. I'll be a concerned sheep in a hen house. Ride em, cowboy. Yep, yep. Now this is as far as I got in the game legitimately. Why did I stop here? Well, I left out another detail about the gameplay. The taxi jobs themselves. I was noticing a pattern here. You need to do a certain number of normal taxi jobs before you can get to the story missions, and you need to do some jobs just to get more cash to keep your cab repaired. Fair enough. The problem is, you're spending half your life driving people around, no matter what. Now this may not be 100% accurate, but I think I've figured out the progression pattern for this game. You start off and ferry at least three people around before you get a story mission. If you complete a story mission, you get to progress to the next story mission, but not without ferrying two more people around. I don't have an exact count, but for the park level, I think there were nine story missions total. So that means you're doing a bare minimum of 19 normal taxi fares on top of the nine story taxi missions just to get through that level. Now the fun part is if you were to mess up or are one second over the time limit at any point during this chain, you have to redo two more ferry missions. Didn't complete the pizza delivery on time? Well go do two more ferry missions. That should only take you about 10 minutes or so assuming you don't make another mistake. Oh, you were too slow during your second ferry mission? Well, that's okay. Just do two more ferry missions. Everywhere you go, two more ferry missions. Forever. This reminds me of a song by Sublime where they have a funny part of the lyrics. I smoke two joints in time of peace and two in time of war. I smoke two joints before I smoke two joints and then I smoke two more. Well, replace smoke two joints with ferry two different people across town and you have the core gameplay of quarantine. As I played more and more, the word that kept coming to mind was tedious. Quarantine does a good job of reminding you that being a taxi driver is a job. Because that's what this feels like. I was really getting sick of this by the third level, but I completely lost it by the fourth. I would rather train to be an actual taxi driver than to keep doing these damn ferry missions. It's not like the main missions where you get story and different things happen. It is just filler. I didn't need the money. I was flush with cash and had lots of upgrades too. And of course, I was usually doing a lot more than two ferry missions at a time because of traffic jams, bad coordinates, and not enough time. This part of the game is bullshit, and it's the core. Sorry, I soiled your upholstery. At least I'm home safely. Now, I won't give up on this completely. I'll at least give you a nickel tour of the projects here. Once again, I am still amazed by the details. We have burning buildings, basketball courts, playgrounds, sex shops. The creators really put some heart into the map design here. You know, this game came out the same year as Doom 2, and that game's big theme was Hell on Earth. The reality, though, was it was just a bunch of more abstract levels that didn't really feel like Earth at all. Well, this looks like hell on Earth to me. All that's missing are the demons. You can also pick up some pretty rad weapons here. Coming through! Oh! I'd buy that for a dollar! Now, I was completely serious about not doing any more missions in this game. It pissed me off too much. In fact, Quarantine is special for having pissed me off more than any other game on the show so far. Those traffic jams combined with the timer. Oh! But because you travel from level to level using passwords, I was able to look those up and skip to the next level. I'd be interested in knowing what happened in the missions, but this game is just not worth it. So the next level is the warp. Kind of a cool contrast to the inner city area, since this feels like a futuristic shipyard. We have giant crushing machines out in the road, a lighthouse, 
And these bridges look awesome. You know, I've heard the question before, if you could take any game and keep it the same, but give it a modern graphics remake, what would it be? Well, I thought, for me, it would be Quarantine. But now I know this game needs more than just a facelift. Oh, and hey, if you thought I was exaggerating the damage, this is sped up footage of me simply driving from one side of town to the other with the strongest armor in the game. It's gone before I even reach the end. Now, according to the passwords I looked up, there was one more level after this, so I was curious to see what it was. So I entered in the code, and no, that's the wrong one. Chemo City is a nice place to visit. Huh, all the other codes were accurate. Maybe this one's bugged and uses the international version? Nope, same thing. I tried this on my CD copy and a floppy disk version that I downloaded. This was baffling me. I couldn't even find pictures of what the next level was, only that this was the code for it. So I started to think, maybe somebody made a typo or the original game had one? Then I tried Chemo City, a nice place to visit. That was it! That was the code! Password accepted! But whoa, wait a minute. That means all these websites that I checked for codes were wrong. GameFAQ, wrong. IGN, wrong. GameSpot, wrong. ActionTrip, wrong. Cheatcodes.com, wrong. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Game Revolution, wrong. Chemo City, a nice place to visit. Chemo City. Okay, Game Revolution, you get an A for effort. You at least try. You know, I'm not even pissed at the person who made this typo. I make typos all the time. I'm pissed at all these major sites that just copied the same wrong information and passed it off as their own. This is not the first time I've seen this happen. This sort of thing has screwed me on other games. And really, this is an issue bigger than gaming. When news sources all copy each other like this and don't fact check anything, all it takes is one wrong piece of information, and then half of the world accepts it as established fact. I mean, this is just a cheat code. It doesn't get much more trivial than this, but modern news reporting is not much different. Bullshit like this is why you have to be a punk and fight the establishment. So anyway, besides the wrong code, they were also wrong in that there is no next level. This is actually the end. So here it is. You escape from Chemo City, then your car dies, I assume because you're going off the grid. That sounds like a pretty stupid plan, actually, especially since you're in the desert. The story I skipped probably explains this. If anybody wants to hack the game and extract the text from it, go for it. Anyway, the game tells me I diverted the water supply to release the psycho drug into the water outside the city to give the civilized world a taste of their own medicine. Is that a punk ending or what? Drake Edgewater, the man, the legend, the cab driver. So that's Quarantine, an amazing game with huge annoyances. You know, when I started this episode, I thought I was gonna be covering a great game, a forgotten gem. After all, that's how I remembered it. But wow, the nostalgia did not carry me all the way. It dumped my ass to the curb. A lot of mixed feelings about this game. A lot of old games did things that just haven't been done again. Quarantine embodies almost everything good and bad about old games. Amazing atmosphere, crappy resolution, fantastic writing, soul-sucking gameplay, punk rock soundtrack, eye-damaging copy protection. I don't know what to think. I will say out of all the games I've played, I think Quarantine is more deserving of a remake than any other. Okay, I'm trying something new for this episode, and I'm giving this game awards. First award, I love this game as much as I hate it. Second award, does it respect your time? And the final award, Punk Approved. I have a soft spot for punk games. And Quarantine is the gold standard that I judge all other punk games against. This game makes me want to put my hair up in Liberty Spikes and set fire to a car. Well, time to wrap this up. 
I may as well save myself some emails and let people know there is another hover taxi game set in the future being developed called Collateral. But despite playing as Zack Edgewater, that seems to have more in common with the game Beam Breakers than it does with Quarantine. Okay, that's it. Stay tuned for the next episode for a potential cult classic. And, uh, stay off the street. I just can't wait to tell Grandma about these astounding adventures.